Hello, I'm Jeff Williams, your action news reporter with all the news that is news across the country. We are here, actually, we're here with a jam-packed information overload on North Star Oasis. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, a week ago, last week's show, I mentioned uh, about uh, 220, then 228, but now it's 221 shopping days left until Christmas. And I had said that a good Christmas present would be a my pillow. Well, I actually got one last week, uh, thanks to my producer. He gave me an early Christmas present. I will have to tell you this: I have had the best night's sleep actually for an entire week now. So that really, really helped. I am well rested. I am not worn down, and I'm ready to give you an update on what's going on around the world. Actually, uh, we're going to give you more of an update about something that happened locally after we do our Prager University segment. So today, we are going to look at what makes America different. Here's Prager U. G'day there. As an outsider, I have a unique perspective from which to view America. As an American friend said to me, Sometimes it takes someone on the outside to remind us what we're like on the inside. I'm an Australian, you might have already guessed that, and I love my home country, and I am proud that my nation has long been a reliable American ally. But I know that Australia is not America, and that my country has not achieved what America has achieved. No country in human history has. What makes America different? There are many answers. But start with one you might not have thought of. Most people think America is all about success. I see it a little differently. I think America is all about failing. Most people in the world don't get the chance to fail, but Americans take it for granted. Only Americans say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. There's even an academic study to prove this. According to a study by Harvard Business School professor Stephen Rogers, most entrepreneurs fail four times before they succeed. Success takes timing and hard work, some good luck, many other factors. But to succeed, you must be given the chance to fail and you must accept responsibility if you do. I love that about Americans. At their best, they don't blame others. They learn from their mistakes and do better the next time. And in America, there's almost always a next time. Nowhere else are you as free to take entrepreneurial risks. Talk to someone who has tried to start a small business in Germany or Brazil, and you'll see what I mean. From the outside looking in, I can only admire this. And I'm not the only one. Just take a look at the CEOs of major Silicon Valley companies. You will see the names of entrepreneurs from all over the world, India, Pakistan, Russia, Israel, you name the country. Why did they come to America to innovate? Because there's a lot of money here? Yes, of course, that's part of it. But there's a lot of money in London and Berlin and Tokyo as well. They came to America because America gave them the chance to fail and therefore the best chance in the world to succeed. And the rest of the world can thank their lucky stars for America's economic success. Not only is America by far the world's largest economy, it is also the world's largest consumer. And the world's economy depends on being able to sell to America. It would also be perfectly natural for Americans to want to keep all this wealth to themselves, but they don't, just the opposite in fact. America has been the most selfless nation in the history of the world. Yet another way in which America is different. What other nation fights for the freedom of others? In Europe, in two world wars, in Korea, in Vietnam, and yes, in Iraq. In all those wars, America had very little or nothing to gain economically. Whenever there is a humanitarian crisis anywhere in the world, Haiti after a hurricane, Indonesia after a tsunami, who is the first to rush aid to these places? No matter where the calamity is, at home or abroad, Americans invariably raise millions of dollars almost instantly to send food and clothing and supplies to people in distress they don't know and will never meet. Who else does that? I love that America is different. What worries me about America is that I see her increasingly trying to act like other nations. 
It worries me to see that so many Americans are drawn to the ossified ideas of Europe. That's the old world. It was old in 1776 even, when America broke away from it. Why would America want to reverse its own revolution? Why would Americans want to follow the economic and social model of a continent that they can see is failing economically and socially? Do Americans really want to emulate France or Greece? It worries me to see so many Americans wallowing in victim status, oh. blaming outside forces for their predicament, rather than accepting responsibility and seeking to improve themselves. It worries me to see American schools debasing America's own glorious history. It worries me to see America's debt and government grow larger while its military and its personal freedoms shrink. It worries me because a weak, self-doubting America is bad for everyone, everywhere, who loves freedom. But these worries never last long because each time I visit America, I encounter a people who are confident competitive, courageous, faithful, idealistic, innovative, inspirational, charitable, and optimistic. It's like no other place in the world. I pray it stays that way. I'm Nick Adams for Prager University. Join and yet I still continue to hear a lot of people, especially around the gun debate, talk about how we have to be like the rest of the world. I mean, I've heard so many times as, as, uh, after the Parkland, Florida school shooting that, oh, Australia, uh, they, they've gotten rid of their guns. Oh, look at what happened in England. But yet yeah, you point out the number of knife and acid attacks that rise. You know, the rest of the world, they've got a lot of problems too. Yeah, we know we have our problems. That, that, that's a given. I mean, you read the newspaper any, any given day, you can read the police blotter. Uh, we've got problems but when you take a look at us compared to the rest of the world I love being an American so I really hope that more people can actually figure out that we have a lot of good things to offer and that the rest of the world actually does want to be like us that's not a bad thing now of course keeping in the spirit of uh, hard work, failure, innovation, we're actually going to take a look at a prediction. We're going to take a look at a prediction of the upcoming hurricane season. Yes, uh, in 14 days, two weeks from now, is the official start of the hurricane season. It starts on June 1st and goes until November 1st. And if you recall last year's hurricane season, there was a lot going on in the Gulf of Mexico, especially with hurricanes, uh, Hurricane Harvey when it stalled over uh, Texas. And then don't forget about Hurricane Irma. We covered uh, Irma pretty extensively here last September. But now, what does that bode for the future? What does that bode for this coming season? And there are a lot of climate ambulance chasers out there but there's one person who repeatedly gets his analysis right. Yes, I am talking about Joe Bastardi from Weatherbell Analytics. And we are going to show you now Joe Bastardi's uh, Saturday summary from this past Saturday, uh, May 12th. And this is his hurricane forecast. So he's going to throw a little bit of complicated stuff at you. Don't worry about some of the acronyms and all of that unless you really want to study, then I would recommend watching uh, his daily updates and Saturday summaries on his uh, website, weatherbell.com, uh, like I do. Yes, I'm a weather junkie, if you haven't figured that out. But Bastardi looks back at historical patterns, and he's been a meteorologist now for, what, 40-something years? So he knows his stuff, and he is pretty accurate. And here is his forecast, which already differs from what we've seen with uh, NOAA and some other organizations. So here's Joe Bastardi with the Saturday summary. What about analytics? Meteorologist Joe Bastardi, your Saturday summary. Well, I got to tell you something. I knew it was going to happen. And it is happening uh, just before the hurricane season starts. A lot of articles coming out. And I wrote a couple articles last year and uh, was very public about them. 
uh, literally trying to set a trap for uh, the blame game that goes on uh, in the climate agenda. And uh, the, uh, I explained what, uh, what led to Harvey's excessive rains um, and uh, did this uh, right after the storm hit. And then uh, uh, also um, uh, pointed out that uh, sometimes in the weather, things are just a matter of luck. And I'm going to show you this, or not luck, uh, show you this a little bit later. But look, this is Tropical Storm Amelia, which came in over here, and then uh, as it, the remnants progressed up here, dumped over 30 inches of rain in uh, parts of uh, Texas, and 48 inches of rain at Medina, Texas, which is located right here. Now, this is in June of 1978, and in a shorter period of time with the storm moving through, dumped four feet of rain. Um, remember, Harvey stalled. So my point is, how did a a, a minimal tropical storm that, uh, you know, there was argument about whether they should have even upgraded to a tropical storm, though at the time I believe that was a good idea. It had wind gusts of 55, 60 miles an hour, Corpus Christi. Um, how the heck did that dump all that rain, right? Now, its record of 48 inches was beaten by Harvey uh, in this area. And, and remember what happened with Harvey, though. Harvey stalled. Now, Harvey didn't stall because of some big blocking subtropical ridge to the north. Quite the contrary, and we saw this well in advance. And I made mention of this on August 21st, while everyone was staring at the eclipse. We were putting out a lot of things to our clients in Texas, telling them to look out. Look out. This was going to be a real bad situation. Phase two of the Madden-Julian oscillation was being forecast, a minimal phase two, but phase two nonetheless said that it's cold in this part of the country. Well, if you have a tropical cyclone coming up here, uh, that's interesting. Phase two is also a high impact uh, 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 for a tropical cyclone. I'll tell you why. When it gets cold like this in the summertime, there's usually trouble very, very close uh, to the United States. Why? Because these waters are always warm and this amount of cold air focuses convergence. So whenever you get that phase two of the MJO, there's a lot of convergence right near the coast, the air coming together. And when air comes together over tropical waters, look out. So that's what the temperatures look like during Harvey. The 500 millibar pattern, Harvey interacted with the tail of this trough to stall the storm. If there was the normal strong or a stronger than normal, even normal subtropical ridge in there, Harvey would have kept moving through. Those rain bands would have never stall, stalled over Houston the way they did. And in addition, uh, you wouldn't have the kind of condensation processes that occur when a cold trough starts a storm. Back in 1963, same thing happened here, October 63, 100 inches of rain in four days in Santiago de Cuba actually had Castro blaming the United States for blocking a storm trying to destroy his country after the Bay of Pigs situation the year before. There's actually some weather history in that. Now, when we, when we look also at Harvey's path, if it had been 50 miles south and here, and we had a normal ridge to the north, guess what? It would have never been picked up. It may, may have been a pretty good storm, but would have stayed to the south. Because of that cold trough to the north picking it up, guess what happened? It turned off to the north. In addition, in addition, again, let me let me point out what this phase two of the Madden Julian oscillation looks like over here. Uh, it it favors storms near the coast of the United States. And that's that's something that a lot of people don't understand that the setup uh, with this cyclone was always there in the first place. When you look at the correlations. Uh, of the Matt and Julian oscillation and what phase two gives. Phase two is an enhanced phase next to the next to North America. So whenever we're going into phase two, and by the way, we're going into it now, and that's why I'm a bit concerned about the northeastern Gulf of Mexico next week. Um, whenever we go into phase two, forecasters should be on the edge of their seats, and certainly we were. So what's happening now is well, the water was warmer than normal. It was. That definitely contributed to it. Not saying it didn't. But the point is, if the cold trough wasn't there, you wouldn't have had the stalling of the storm 
And even though we could argue about, well, whether, you know, it rained, would have rained 25 inches or 35 inches, from uh, whether that was because of the warm water, it would not have stalled and left those repeating bands there. In addition, the cooling of the storm enhances the condensation processes. So without that cold trough in there, which is opposite of the, of the whole theory that subtropical ridges are going to be stronger with these storms to the north of them, make them move slower, that's, that's not what's going on here, all right? This was, this was not the case to use to buttress that argument. It was like in, in the year before, 2016, they were trying to say Hermine, which took 11 days to cross cross the ocean and then become a storm in the Northeast Gulf at the height of the hurricane season, Hermine was a sign of climate change. I'm like, how can that be? It's a minimal hurricane hitting Florida at the height of the hurricane season. You see, you got to know which storms to use. Now, there's storms I've seen. I said, well, that's, that's pretty wild. It did this or did that. But then again, we have observation techniques. We didn't. So I am laying out in front of you why this storm was no surprise, right? And in addition, like I said, if it, had, if it had just been a little bit further south, if that ridge was stronger than normal, okay, the big argument is that the subtropical ridge is going to be stronger than normal. If it was even normal, it would have drove the storm in here. Instead, you had phase two, Matt and Julian oscillation, all sorts of cool here across the United States, stronger than normal trough tailing down, picks up the storm, and then it gets trapped in here. And when it gets trapped this close to the Gulf, inflow keeps coming in. What do you think is going to happen, right? Okay. Let's get to the upcoming hurricane season. We are tracking very close with the uh, multivariate ENSO index with 2017-18. Now, last year I got fooled to the total ace. Did not get fooled in the fact that the major, uh, major hit drought was going to end. So we said that last May, that the, the, the big storms were coming for the United States, no matter what the ace did. Now, so, and that was the reason I didn't think it was going to be as big a year in total was because the multivariate dental index was in a pretty hefty El Nino stage and it just collapsed, right? Well, this year, I think it's the opposite. It's tracking along 2006 right over here. And I think uh, we're going to see it go the other way. And I have my reasons for that. Let me outline them. There's a lot of warm water laying underneath here in the Pacific. In addition, we're seeing the Southern Oscillation Index crash. What does that mean? That means the easterlies are weakening. And in the analog years I have, where I think a Madoki El Nino is going to develop late in the season on into next winter. Hint, hint to next winter. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, we see the rapid drop-offs occurring at this time of the year. That's 2002, and there it is in 2006, and there it is in 2009. I, actually, it's back over here. There was another second one as uh, we got into the hurricane season, 2009. And then 2014, the most recent year, uh, the downturn is occurring in here, as you can see. So it likes to do it in April and May, and it's doing it right now. So there, we have, we have the warm water laying there. We have the Southern Oscillation Index changing. So there you can see we have the setup for what's going on. Precipitation patterns in the United States in March and April. Look at California, right? Look at Florida, and look at this area of wet weather in here and drier weather out here, right? The means in those years that I pointed out, wet in California, wet here, drier back in here, look at Florida. And then what happened though in May and June of those same analog years, Florida got wet, was dry in Texas, right? See California drying out, tends to be a lot of wet in the Northeast. Look what's going on the next couple of weeks. Lo and behold, it's going to that pattern. Now, this is a little bit different in here, but there's the dry in Texas, the wet over here. Uh, California is still a little bit wet in here, but you see the similarities. So the weather now is giving us a hint of what the weather's going to do later. Nothing magical about it, nothing mystical about it, nothing man-made about it, if you understand. I'm not doing any hocus-pocus here. I'm showing you what's in front of us. Now, I just, I know this is a hurricane, Update, but I want to show you this kind of El Nino, I think, coming on does not mean a wet winter in California. It's a Madoki, I think, is coming on. It's dry there. It's wet in here. But look what it does with the temperatures. And three out of four of those winters were very snowy. The other one, 0607, where we're tracking now, wasn't as snowy. 
but we had the coldest February on record right in here. So, it, 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 see this, it's May, let's say May 12th, and um, I'm displaying a forecast for what may happen down the road here for you. See how I, uh, see how I try to help out here? I'm always thinking of you. All right, so uh, this is the current sea surface temperatures a, a week ago when I drew up the forecast in the Atlantic. There's the cool here, the warm here, that's directly opposite of last year. Uh, we're seeing computer models uh, for the hurricane season, seeing the warming coming here, the cooling in here. All right, so that's starting to take place. Now, what's interesting is the pressure forecast. This is this and this relationship here means that the main development region of the Atlantic should not have as much activity as last year, right? And you see higher, when you have higher pressures here, lower pressures here, you're slowing down the easterlies. And what that generally means is that the El Nino is coming on. But this is very interesting right here. What this says to me is, well, you don't worry about the long track storms that much this year, but in close development, it's going to be a pain. And when you have high pressure located over this part of Canada and on into the Northwest Atlantic, you have to be concerned about things just flaring up in close and then hitting the United States. So it's a very interesting look. Last year, in high pressure arced across the north. There's the high pressure in the Pacific. There's the, low, the lower pressures out in Australia, right? Opposite of what the forecast is this year, right? So we had the big A season last year. See where that center of low pressure is and see the high pressure, high pressure here, right? The analog years and the years, these are the years that we do not get big hits in the United States. You see the low pressure there in the Eastern Pacific and you see the center of the low pressure is further north. In other words, there's higher, even though these pressures are low, they're not as low relative to averages here. What does that do? That ruins the convergence. Remember, you're talking about, when you're talking over tropical waters, air that moves up very, very quickly. And if there's lower pressure to the north, it, it, it disrupts the normal processes that you would be looking for for storms to intensify as they come toward the United States. So that higher pressure in here by the European uh, forecast, a higher pressure here means, okay, we're probably not going to see the activity we had, uh, the ACE activity, but the higher pressure up to the north has me bothered, all right, about impact this year. And um, again, there's that, there's that picture I was showing you. So what do we come up with? We come up with a total amount of storms of 9 to 13, 5 to 7 hurricanes, 1 to 3 of them major. The problem is where the strongest storms are going to occur relative to averages and relative to the total ACE index. So our ACE index started at 90 to 110, which was normal. <laughs> so we're now a little bit below normal, but we may have these kind of storms that deepen in, in close to the coast this year because of the pressure patterns that set up. Let me see what this last one is. Oh, yes. This is what I'm worried about uh, Monday, Wednesday period, that low pressure develops here, feeds back, starts acquiring subtropical characteristics and uh, impacts this area. Already a lot of rain going on in Florida in front of it. But right now it's a cold trough. However, water temperatures are marginal. So we'll see what happens Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then the following week, we got to look down in the Caribbean because we're going into that uh, phase two of the Madden Julian oscillation. And so phase two at this time of the year over warm waters uh, can cause problems. Let me see if I could get that. Let's see if I have a, the latest uh, MJO forecast. Yes, I do. It just came in. Okay. So actually it came in a little while ago. I just, uh, I just put it up here now. So let me see if I could, let me see if I could show this to you. So the understand, I always do this. I always wind up late. Or there's always a always something I want to put up that I didn't see before that I put up at the end. Okay, here we are. So the Madden Julian oscillation is forecast into that phase two over here, which is favorable for in close tropical activity across the uh, across our tropical in close waters of the United States, and so that's why I'm concerned. So it's not it's not uh, magic. And it's not, as I said before, it's not magical, it's not mystical, it's not man-made, it's what nature does, and nature will do what nature does. Okay? Does that make sense? Sometimes it does. Enjoy the weather, it's the only weather you got. 
So, how does that stack up with what the other experts have to say? Well, I'm reading a Newsweek article that was published yesterday, May 16th. Hurricanes are getting stronger rapidly, and experts predict 2018 season may be above average. Um, new research revealed that hurricanes are beginning stronger more rapidly than they did 30 years ago. The findings are especially worrying as those along the Atlantic Ocean brace for the start of the hurricane season on June 1st, and scientists have already predicted an above average 2018 season. The study, published online this May in Geophysical Research Letters, analyzed data from NOAA's National Hurricane Center and the U.S. Navy's Joint Typhoon Warning Center on hurricanes that occurred from 1986 to 2015. The team was particularly interested in how quickly the hurricanes intensified or grew in strength. Uh, let's skip over a couple paragraphs here. The researchers built 16 climate change models and were able to pinpoint the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation as the weather pattern driving the hurricane intensification. The AMO largely controls water temperature in the North Atlantic. In recent years, the cycle has led to warmer waters throughout the ocean. Um, and then... Recent predictions from the Department of Atmospheric Science at Colorado State University suggested a slightly above average hurricane season, a slightly above average probability for major hurricanes making landfall along the United States coastline and in the Caribbean. However, the season will not likely be as bad as last year, which is estimated to be one of the most destructive and most expensive in hurricane seasons in U.S. history. Well, um, expert. Uh, it's, we're not going to say E-X-P-E-R-T. We're going to say an expert. E-X hyphen S-P-U-R-T. It has been a drip under the pressure. It has been the drip. Been the drip. Anyhow, when I look at what Bastardi has to say, it makes a whole lot more sense than this. And here's the reason. And there's no doubt, because he's already talked about it in several other of his uh, daily updates about the AMO, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. He's talked about the AMO. He talks about the uh, MJO. He talks about the Southern Oscillation Index. He looks at all of the patterns. He looks at surface, sea surface temperature. He looks at all of this and then goes back in history to find out uh, the years where the similar patterns are setting up, as he just explained to you. And so I actually put more credence with Bastardi than I do with uh, comparing, what was it, 16 climate change models? They can't, if the climate change models actually predicted climate change accurately, I might put a little bit more credence into them, but I, I will go with Bastardi any day of the week. So that's the hurricane update. It's going to be interesting when we get into September and October to take a look at who is accurate. The uh, research from, uh, uh, from the paper in the geophysical research letters and what we have on Newsweek or what Joe Bastardi says. And if I ever remember, perhaps we might come back to this in the future. Well, we're also going to take a quick look here. Well, I'm not going to quick, but I need to transition now um, with something else that happened on Saturday, since we had a Saturday summary, and that is Quinton John Gifford from the USS Oklahoma was buried at Fort Snelling. And we were there. Um, Quinton, we've brought him up on the show in the past. You can catch our archives at uh, YouTube, youtube.com slash Oasis or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Oasis. We've covered the USS Oklahoma pretty intently, uh, but Quinton's brother, um, Harold, is a good friend of mine. And so I really felt out of respect for the Gifford family that I needed to be there for them, and um, so I was. And yes, I uh, ended up having Quinton's entire service record pulled from the National Archives about a year or two ago. Once we found out about the uh, Oklahoma 
project to identify those remains. So what we are going to show you right now is actually, we're, we're going to give you a little, a couple of clips on the uh, funeral uh, out of respect for uh, Quentin. First thing we're going to actually show you is Harold, my friend, um, his recollections of his brother. Um, keep in mind, you know, this happened almost 70, what, 76, almost 77 years ago. Um, so we're going to go with Harold's remembrances of his brother uh, from the funeral on Saturday. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also has made an all-naval and military activities on the principal island of Ohio. We take you now to Washington. The details are not available. because my brother Quentin was stationed at Pearl Harbor and he was on the battleship of Oklahoma. We had heard that the Oklahoma had been badly damaged and was on fire. And this caused great concern. Our hearts were enveloped in fear and sorrow. It's been our hope that Quentin may have been on shore leave at the time and was spared. As the hours and days passed in agonizing anticipation, there was no word from anyone about the fate of Quentin. We had even hoped that someday we might hear from him personally. Two weeks of prayer and hope passed until Sunday the 21st of December. We had just begun our noon meal with the family when the phone rang. Western Union informed me that due to the storm, there were no bicycle deliveries of telegrams. That, and they asked if we would find Mr. Gifford to take this telegram from the War Department. And as I listened, I had the phone to my dad, and I heard the message to the War Department regrets to inform you that your son Quentin is listed as missing in action. Of course, my dad had been under a lot of stress for two weeks. He was 46 years old, and Quentin was his first born. As he heard the message, on the telephone, it became very weak. I was almost in shock. I helped him to a couch where he reclined. And I recall that he had his eyes closed and he was sobbing that this can't be true. My mother was sitting nearby and having overheard the conversation. She also began to weep. My father had uh, just learned about the death of his firstborn. And as far as myself personally, I had established a very close relationship with Quentin. He meant a lot to me. And I was very sad and sorrowful. I went to my room, put my face in. It was the first time I'd ever lost anyone that close in my life. 
Quentin had been a home on leave in July of 1940. Before returning to his ship, he had visited me at the farm where I was working after having dropped out of high school at Loyola and Mankato. Quentin asked if I would make a promise to go back and finish high school. He pointed out that I was on kind of a dead-end road with what I was doing, and that if I would go back and finish high school when he was out of the Navy together, we would find a way to go to college. We said goodbye for the last time. <coughs> As he returned to the Oklahoma. <clears throat> I returned to school and I followed his advice. And not only did he advise me to do this, but that I worked very hard to do my very best, which I tried and I did it very well. By virtue of Quentin's advice, after he had been killed for a while, I was able to enroll in the U.S. Army Air Corps Aviation Cadet Program, which led to become a pilot and officer. And by virtue of that, it launched a career in aviation, which I would do every bit of it all over again. It was just a wonderful blessing, all on behalf of my brother's advice. I've been asked by many people, what was Quentin like? <clears throat> I guess I was told by a to be careful and not go off the script because you might go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> but I just wanted to mention that when people ask me, what was Quentin like? <clears throat> I remember. Garrison Taylor was one time asked who would he like to be remembered as. It would be, um, oh, you could think of any number of people. And he thought of that. He said, well, you know, I'd kind of like to be the kind of person that everybody else would like to be like. And that's a really good way of describing Quentin. He's the kind of guy that anybody would like to be like. But basically, Quentin was basically a very honest person. He was a no-nonsense person. He had become pretty well educated after having left school after the eighth grade. Quentin had <clears throat> joined the National Guard where he began to gather some military experience. And then Quentin had spent time in the CCC camp, and I know most of you have never heard of it, go with it up and get all the information. But at that experience, he gained a lot of experience in joining the workforce. And he began to learn the value of education. When Cutton joined the Navy, it was for serving his country, but it was also for a other reasons, adventure, and also to continue his education. So, when we were young, our heroes were people that most of you may not have heard of. They were Elliot Ness, probably some of you remember from Gangbusters, and there were uh, Melvin Purvis. And these were our heroes who had taken down the likes of Dillinger. Maybe face the Olsen for the five dollars back ones. So Clinton had developed a sort of a desire to be one of them. And I really do believe that Quentin would have been very good at what he chose to do. He realized that the first step to reach that goal would be a law degree. So he had at the time, the last time that I saw him, he said, together we'll get that law degree and we'll go from there and see where it leads us. One last thing, I'd like to thank each and every one of you that have had a part of this celebration of Quentin's life and his memory. 
when I'm surrounded by so many wonderful people, each and every one of them. It's just a feeling that seems to permeate the air of goodness and love. And for that, I want to thank you all, each and every one of you. And that was Harold Gifford at his brother Clinton John Gifford's funeral Saturday at Fort Snelling. I realize that the audio may have made it a little bit difficult to hear, but that's the way it is with the Fort Snelling Chapel with the audio. Um, everything just echoes there. But, um, you know, Clinton passed away at Pearl Harbor in the USS Oklahoma. So, you know, can, I can't even imagine 76, 77 years of not knowing when he would actually be coming home. And he sounded like he was a remarkable person. Anyhow, we are now going to take a look actually at the burial ceremony at the Fort Snelling National Cemetery.
the uh, USS Oklahoma was a 27,500 ton Nevada class battleship. Uh, it was built in Camden, New Jersey and was commissioned in 1914. Uh, generally operated in the Atlantic, uh, out of the Atlantic fleet for the next few years. Uh, Mid-1918 it went to the European waters to help protect convoys. And then late that year, and in, and in uh, June 1919, uh, the Oklahoma escorted President Woodrow Wilson to his voyages, on his voyages to and from France. 1921, the battleship moved to the Pacific and it visited the west coast of South America prior to joining the uh, Pacific Fleet. Uh, the Oklahoma was modernized at the Philadelphia Navy Yard in 1927 and 1929, emerging with a greatly altered appearance and notably improved battle worthiness. After a brief uh, service with the scouting fleet, uh, she returned to the Pacific in the mid-1930s, and uh, in mid-1930, and had renovated uh, and had renewed her participation in the battle fleet's activities. Uh, July 1936, the Oklahoma was sent to Europe to help evacuate U.S. citizens and others during the Spanish Civil War, and she rejoined the battle fleet in the Pacific later that year. 1940, the Oklahoma's base was shifted from the U.S. West Coast, I believe San Francisco, uh, over to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and she was at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, when she was attacked by uh, the Japanese uh, Type 91 aerial torpedoes. There were approximately eight torpedoes that hit the uh, hull of the Oklahoma, uh, where she was berthed near um, or next to the USS Maryland, uh, right off of Ship Island. Uh, with her port side torn open, over much of the length, um, the Oklahoma r rapidly rolled over and had sank in the harbor bottom with the loss of 429 crew members. Uh, most of the men were trapped in her upturned hull and uh, were, many of the men trapped in her upturned hull were cut free through the intense efforts of sailors and civilian Navy Yard employees. I do uh, remember the story of a Navy diver who uh, had to cut through the hull and I think there was like 13 inch armored plating to go through. I mean, it was just in insane. And um, 388 of them were uh, buried in unmarked graves. I mean, they were marked as unknown. Uh, we had played on this show uh, before. I think it was Paul Goodyear, a survivor. Uh, I know we, we had an account from two of the survivors, I believe this one from, was from Paul Goodyear, talking about how he ended up going on to the Oklahoma for the first time since it had been uh, um, operated. And he remembered seeing nothing but bones. And he couldn't see anything because there was no electricity on, you know, at that point in time. And so he brought on the lanterns and looked around and all he could see through the lantern light was bones. There was no flesh. The salt water and any other organisms had eaten all of the flesh. Because it wasn't until around March of uh, 43 when the Oklahoma was brought, brought upright. So that's the biggest reason why it took so long for the remains to get identified. And I was told, this was brought up at the funeral, but uh, uh, I was told that Quentin was most likely one of the first people to die in the attack uh, based upon what they had seen from uh, the way the remains were returned. Just from the damage to the remains, he was prob probably uh, not long for this world after the attack began. Harold even mentioned how he was at least comforted in knowing that he didn't suffer. That some of these guys were trapped in an air pocket, they couldn't get him out, and you know these guys undoubtedly drowned. So that was America's entrance into World War II. It was a very violent beginning. And yet some of those wounds are only now becoming healed seven, you know, over 75 years later. Um, I'm really thankful that the uh, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency is taking 
the uh, repatriation of U.S. service members remains seriously. Uh, when I served as the co-chair of political action for Minnesota Won't Forget POWMIA Incorporated back in from uh, 1990 to 1993, that was something that we, that we POW activists were wanting. We wanted the government to take this issue seriously. Now back then we still thought there were uh, POWs left alive, especially in Southeast Asia. But we fought really, really hard just to keep, keep you know, this issue in f alive in front of the public. And now we're starting to really see the benefits. It's not just from the Oklahoma. Um, we, they're repatriating remains from all around the world all the time. And they've got an incredible mission. And I'm really thankful that even though this is 30 years, since, almost 30 years since uh, you know, we were pushing for all of this, that we're starting to see some tangible results. And then when I see my friend uh, Harold Gifford and his sister June just relieved knowing that their brother's home, and after all these years he's home, that makes a difference. So tonight, please take a moment and say a prayer. Prayer for the families who have still have loved ones who fought for this country whose remains have not been returned home. Please say a prayer for comfort and that they'll get their closure soon. And with that, we're going to leave you today with the um, notorious, N-O-T-E, uh, O-R-I-O-U-S, notorious, uh, from the, uh, the, the barbershop quartet belonging to the North Star Chorus. Uh, Dwayne Rigg, Ron Riley, Grant Warning, and Steve Zorn singing the Navy hymn. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, reminding you there's 221 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching North Star Oasis. We'll see you next week.